Okay, so now I'm going to talk about solving the Schrodinger equation using what we've learned. So all the Schrodinger equation tells you is how your state cat evolves in time. So obviously that's valuable because I, I said before, if you know how your cat evolves in time, then, or if you know it for all times, then you know everything there is to know about the system. So we want to solve this equation and that will tell us what psi is, what, what our state is for all time. So what is this equation? It just says that i times h bar times the time derivative of our state vector is equal to this operator h acting on the state vector. h is just the Hamiltonian. It's the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, so just the total energy of the system. And of course, energy is an observable quantity, so naturally the energy operator becomes, or the energy becomes an operator in quantum mechanics. And so what do we do with this? How do we, how do we actually do something? Well, basically we take a system that we want to describe. So in our case, I'm going to be talking about a spin one half particle in a magnetic field. And we try and write down what the Hamiltonian should be. So how do we figure that out? Well, there isn't a way in general to just write down what the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian should be besides pretty much guessing. But we can make educated guesses based by uh, looking at classical systems that are kind of analogous to the quantum systems and working out what the Hamiltonian is there. And we know how to write down the Hamiltonian for a classical system in general. It's just the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And so we'll do that. And then we'll just write down uh, basically kind of from that expression, the classical expression, uh, try and figure out a quantum mechanical expression for the Hamiltonian. So I'll, maybe that's confusing, but I'll, uh, I'm about to work out a specific example here. So for our uh, spin one half particle in a magnetic field, what do we do? Well, we can think of our, our, uh, our spin one half particle will have a charge and it's, we can think of it as spinning. Just think of it as a, a tiny charged particle that's kind of spinning in place. And we know that if we have a charge and it's going in like a, a loop, uh, basically a tiny current loop will act like a magnetic dipole. And a ma magnetic dipole um, will just try to align itself with a magnetic field. So what we're going to assume is that the, uh, the mag the, our spin one half particle has a magnetic dipole moment that is proportional to its angular momentum, which kind of makes sense. The angular momentum kind of describes how fast it's spinning. And if it's, you know, the greater, the, the magnetic dipole moment of a current loop is proportional to the current. So you would think that if the particle is spinning faster, that would be like the current is going faster. So it would increase the dipole moment. And I've just written this uh, constant proportionality here, gamma. So it's not, we don't care what its value is. The point is uh, the magnetic dipole moment of our particle will be proportional to its angular momentum. So we can write down uh, the classical expression. So for a uh, the equation of motion, or at least the Hamiltonian for a uh, magnetic dipole in a magnetic field. So it will have a potential energy that is minus mu dot b. So basically it wants to align itself with the magnetic field. If mu is along b, then the energy is minimized. If it's anti-parallel to b, then it's maximized. And using this expression here, we can write this as minus gamma s dot b. And then I'm free to choose uh, my magnetic field to be along the z direction. And in that case, our Hamiltonian would just be this, minus gamma b times the z component of the angular momentum. And looking at this expression, uh, we can already kind of see how we would turn this into a quantum mechanical operator. Uh, we just want to, we just derived an expression last time for a spin z operator. So why not just assume that the quantum Hamiltonian, the operator looks like this. It's minus gamma b times r, uh, spin z angular momentum operator. 
which again, I worked out last time that we could write that in terms of these outer products here. And the reason we want to write this in terms of these outer products of base cats and bras is that we can also write our cats. We can write those as we know as a linear combination of our uh, two basis vectors. And this is all we need to work out to basically solve the Schrodinger equation is we, we want to basically express our operator and our kets all in terms of some basis. And then once we've done that, that allows us to solve it. So how does that work out? Well, if we just plug these things into the Schrodinger equation, what we get is we get uh, i h bar times the time derivative of our state vector. And the time dependence is in these coefficients. So I just written, uh, you know, these c dots here, where dot just means derivative with respect to time. And that should equal the Hamiltonian, which we've derived here, acting on the state vector. And then I can, uh, I can compute this. I can just FOIL this out, basically. Uh, if you do that, I'll leave that as an exercise. It's not hard. You just FOIL it. And what you'll get is this. And basically, to, for this equation to be satisfied, the coefficients of each of our basis vectors has to be the same on both sides. So basically, what it tells us is that i h bar c dot is equal to minus gamma b h bar over 2 times uh, c. And i h bar c dot minus is equal to plus gamma b h bar over 2 c minus. So the more... Uh, I guess technical way to do it is to project this equation onto the uh, plus axis. So if you take the inner product of both sides of this with the plus bra, then uh, obviously this term I'd get a 1, this term I'd get a 0, 1, 0. So those would go away. And I'd get the same thing. I just get that the coefficient of my plus uh, ket has to be equal to this coefficient over here. And we can, and then similarly, we could project onto the minus ket, and that would just tell us that the uh, coefficients of the minus ket should be equal on both sides. And that leads us to these differential equations for our coefficients. And luckily, they're very easy differential equations to solve. So I'll just tell you, and you can verify if you can't solve this, that this is the solution. So we have C as a function of time is equal to c plus of zero. So this is just the initial value at time equals zero. I'm just assuming that I'm just going to write it as c plus of zero. And then times this exponential factor, e to the i gamma b t over two. And then uh, c minus looks similar, only with a uh, minus sign in the exponential. And so we've solved the Schrodinger equation. We have our state vector as a function of time it will just be uh, this. So, so our state vector as a function of time will just be c plus of zero times this exponential and so on. Uh, another thing I want to note is that rather than working it out just in terms of our uh, you know, bras and kets, we, what we could have done is written down is represented all of these things, our kets and our operator, using our column vectors and matrices. And the advantage of doing that is that it's just less to write. You know, this is the simplest system we have, and already kind of writing all these kets and things is kind of annoying. But if we write it in terms of these representations, then it just reduces to the simple matrix equation. And obviously, if you work out this matrix equation, you will be led to the same set of equations, uh, but it's a more compact way of writing it. Uh, but so we've solved the Schrodinger equation, and we have our ket. We could represent it using this column vector. But this isn't, it's not obvious, you know, what this means. I mean, how do we know that we've done things correctly? Well, what we can do is we can look at the solution, we can look at the uh, z component of the angular momentum in the classical case and kind of ask, well, does it look 
the same in this quantum mechanical solution. So all we need to know is that if we uh, have a magnetic dipole and magnetic field, it will feel a torque in the direction of mu cross b. So in this case, uh, I forgot my gamma here. So in this case, uh, s cross the z direction, because b is in the z direction, and our magnetic moment is proportional to the angular momentum. So what that means is the torque will be, because it's in the s cross z direction, it's, uh, it'll be perpendicular to z. And if there's no component of torque in, the, in a certain direction, then the angular momentum along that direction is conserved. Just like if there's no force along a certain direction, the momentum along that direction is conserved. So this tells us that SZ should be constant as our state evolves. So is that true? Well, what we can do is calculate the expectation value of SZ in our uh, state cat as a function of time. And if we do that, we know we worked out last time that the expectation value will just be given by h bar over 2 times the modulus squared of the plus coefficient, which is all of this, minus the modulus squared of uh, the minus coefficient. And if you work that out, you get this. And the big thing to notice is that the exponential terms, I'll end up with an e to the i something here, and then an e to the minus i something here. And whenever you have e to the i something times e to the minus i something, that is just 1. Similarly for this term, so what I get is just this. So the time dependence cancels out. So the expectation value of our uh, z component of our angular momentum is constant. And so that's a sign that we are doing things correctly.